Good morning, everyone. I'm Volkan, and this is Daniel. Today, we are going to talk about, uh, uh, we work on Apple GPU compiler. And today, we are going to talk about generating, uh, generating optimized code with Global ISL, or Global ISL going beyond networks. Here's the agenda for today's talk. We'll start with what is Global ISL, uh, its goals, and how it works. Then we'll look at some of the components, particularly Global ISL Combiner. Then we'll talk about how to test optimizations and how to debug issues. And finally, we'll talk about uh, declarative combiner, what it is and why we need it. But first, here's a bit of history. Back in 2017, we got Global ISL fully working for our target, but we had not worked on the code quality yet. So it wasn't as good as selection like ISL. Over the past two years, we added several new features to improve the code gen quality. And by 2019, the code gen quality has improved. It is improved to the point that Apple GPU compiler is now using Global ISL. It's enabled in iOS 13, and it's running on millions of Apple devices. Okay, what is Global ISL? Global ISL is a new instruction selection framework in LLVM. It supports more global optimizations. For example, unlike selection like ISL, Global ISL is able to match across basic blocks. It is more flexible. With Global ISL, instruction selection can range from the speed of fast ISL to the quality of selection like ISL. It is also easier to understand, maintain, and test. Finally, it keeps all the state in the machine IR. With Global ISL, you can dump the machine function at any point, and it accurately reflects the program. There is no need to look at temporary information for each pass. For more details, you can watch Quentin's talk from 2015 LLVM Developers Meeting, a proposal for global instruction selection. Now let's talk about the anatomy of Global ISL a little bit. Like selection deck ISL, Global ISL takes LLVM IR and generates tar uh, machine IR with target instructions. But unlike selection deck ISL, it doesn't pass through other representations. It goes straight to the MIR representation. The overall Global ISL pipeline consists of four main passes. The IR translator takes LLVM IR and converts it into generic MIR. Then Legalizer replaces unsupported operations with supported ones so that the later passes can handle. Then the register bank selector binds generic virtual registers to a register bank. And lastly, instruction selector selects target instructions. Today, we won't be talking about these passes, although there have been some interesting changes lately. For more details, you can watch the Global ISL tutorial my colleagues gave from 2017 LLVM developers meeting. Today, we are going to add two more passes to the pipeline, combiners. Combiners optimize generic MIR or MIR by transforming some patterns into something more desirable. Before going into details, I should mention that this diagram is just one way of including combiners. It is possible to include them in many places after the IR translator. However, the requirements on the combiner does vary depending on where in the pipeline it is. These requirements get stricter the later in the pipeline you go. For example, pre-legalizer is fairly relaxed, but post-register bank selector has to be careful to avoid disturbing assigned register banks. But why do we need combiners? Here's why. Back in 2017, we weren't focusing on the code quality a lot. Our main goal was to make sure that Global LCL is able to handle as much as possible without falling back to selection like ISL. And of course, do that correctly. On the graph, the one in blue is selection like ISL, and the bigger one in red is global ISL. As you can see, there was clearly a difference between instruction count uh, there was clearly a difference between uh, Global ISL and Selection like ISL in terms of instruction count. On average, Global ISL was generating 30% more instructions. This is why a year and a half ago, we turned our attention towards optimizations, specifically combiner, because there were obvious opportunities to replace multiple instructions with one. Since then, we have been trying to improve our code quality by adding optimization. And here's what happened. Today, Global ISL is able to generate code as good as selection like ISL for our target. On average, the difference in instruction count is less than 2%. And the runtime performance is similar to what we get with selection like ISL. 
There is still some work to do in order to go beyond this, but it looks promising. What about compile time performance though? As a GPU compiler, it's one of the important metrics for us. We spend a lot of time, uh, compile time on optimizations, and we brought the code coil to match selection like I saw. Where do we stand now? Today, on average, Global ISL improves the compile time performance by about 8%. But this is both optimizations and code gen, not only instruction selection. On instruction selection, the difference is much more. Global ISL is about 45% faster. So we were able to generate code as good as selection like I saw and improve the compile time performance. That's great. Now let's talk about how we did this. In order to generate better code, we needed a few things. We needed common sub-expression elimination, combiners, known bits, and lastly, simplify the mandate bits. We needed these features to improve the code gen quality, but at the same time, we want to improve our compile time performance too. Let's start with CSC. For CSC, we considered using machine CSC, but it was expensive to run it after each global ISL pass. Also, we found out there are some target-specific combines generating suboptimal code using machine CSC. This is why in global ISL, we chose a continuous CSC approach. We added a specialized machine IR builder called CSC MIR builder, which tries to CSC instructions when building. CSC MIR Builder uses an analysis pass that provides information about the instructions. It is currently basic block local, but we might consider making it global in the future. And it supports only a subset of generic operations for now, but we plan to extend that soon. We also plan to add support to CSC target instructions. It is easy to enable CSC simply by using a CSC MIR Builder, but there are some things to be aware of. CSC needs to be informed when something changes, such as erasing an instruction, switching opcodes, or replacing registers. For creation and erasure, it installs a machine function delegate to handle them automatically. So there is no need to inform it for these kind of changes. But for other kind of changes, the change observer needs to be called so that CSC infrastructure knows about the changes. We'll talk about the observer later, but it's basically a means of um, means to maintain information as MIR changes. CSC MIR Builder allows us to generate better code, but what about its compile time cost? When we were experimenting with it, we were expecting a big compile time cost, but it didn't cause a significant regression. For some cases, it actually improved the compile time performance. This is because later passes had less work to do as CSC reduced the number of instructions. Overall, CSE helped us to improve the code quality with a good price. Next up is combiner. A combiner is a pass that applies a set of combined rules to machine instructions. It is probably the most important component for producing good codes, and it can be quite expensive in terms of compile time. Before going into more details, I want to talk about combines briefly. A combine is simply a compiler optimization that transforms a pattern into something more desirable for the target. Here we have a simple LLVMIR function. First, it takes the input and zero extend, to, zero extend it to I16. Then it zero extends the extended value to I32 and finally returns the result. As you can see, the first instruction here is actually redundant because it's only used by the following zero extend instruction. We can simplify this by replacing the source value of the second instruction with the input. Now that we know what a combine is, let's talk about the global ISL combiner. Global ISL combiner consists of three main pieces. Combiner is the main component that iterates over the machine function and tries to combine each machine instruction. Combiner info is the interface for targets to specify which operations to be combined and how. And lastly, Combiner Helper is a library of generic combines which can be used by any global ISL pass if needed. Here's a diagram that shows how they interact. Let's assume we have a combiner pass called my target combiner pass. All we need is a, a combiner object using target's combiner info. Combiner is going to handle pretty much everything we need, so there is no need to change the pass from this point on. The most important thing here is combiner info. It's the one that defines what to combine and how. 
Here's how a basic combiner endpoint is implemented. There's a target-specific combiner helper, and depending on the optimization level, it either tries to combine everything or only copy instructions. Unlike selection dag ISL, global ISL is quite flexible here. It is possible to include or exclude combines easily. You can change your strategy based on your target, sub-target, or optimization level. And it's easy to add combines. Here we have a simple one. This code block implements the combine with ZX we saw in the previous section. First, it tries to match instructions, then it builds a new instruction and erases the current one. Even though the logic is pretty simple here, it's a bit hard to follow with all these checks. We found this approach difficult because it tends to require a lot of code for some combines. Considering we have some combines matching half a dozen instructions, uh, we found out there are some combines that don't fit on our screens. This is why we added MI pattern match. MI pattern match provides simple and easy mechanism to, uh, to match generic MI add patterns. It is able to match uh, operations, registers, constants, etc. It's also able to match commutative operations without duplicating the pattern or swapping the operand. It is similar to what we have for LLVMIR, so it's easy to use if you're already familiar with it. And it's easy to implement uh, combines using the matchers. Here's the same combine implemented using the matchers. It looks more readable and easier to implement. The matching part looks much better now. Let's take a look at the replacement part. For this specific combine, it's actually not necessary to build another instruction. It's not efficient. Instead, we can just replace the source operand with the match register. Here's how it's done. Instead of calling build ZX and erasing the current instruction, it simply replaces the first operand with the source rec. This is more efficient, but there is uh, a couple of things to be aware of. Firstly, when setting registers like this, we need to be careful with the register classes and register banks. The other thing is, as I mentioned before, changing instructions required informing the observer. Here we first call changing instruction to start a transaction, then after setting the register, we call change the instruction to end the transaction. Let's talk about the observer a little bit. Observer is a component that notifies other global ISL components as machine instruction change. As I mentioned earlier, observer needs to be informed when something change because other components such as CSE depend on observer to keep track of the changes. Created instruction and erased instruction are handled automatically through the machine function delegate. But when changing an instruction, observer needs to be called manually uh, by calling changing instruction and changed instruction. This is important because failing to inform it uh, might expose issues. Next up is norm bits analysis. There are many combines that need to know some of the, uh, some of the bits for them to be valid. For example, A plus one can be replaced with A or one if the least significant bit is zero. To provide this information, we added the norm bits analysis pass, which lazily computes the norm bits for a given register. It currently provides information on the known ones, known zeros, and the bit leftovers are, uh, and the bit leftover are unknowns. Here we have a simple example that's enabled by knowing the bits. We don't know anything about percent zero, but the constants are easy to know. Using the constants and the definition of the end operation, we can easily determine that most of the bits of percent four are zero. Then we can use that knowledge to merge the mask and produce a single operation, single end operation. There is many more, there is many more combines like this that's enabled by knowing the bits. In selection like ISL, known bits is a function with no caching. This means selection like performs a lot of redundant computation. In global ISL, known bits is a lazily computed analysis pass. Having an analysis pass allows us to improve it in the future. We will be able to add support for caching within a pass, caching between passes, and early exit when enough uh, is known. This will also allow us to have alternative implementations. One last note on known bits analysis. Targets can extend it by overriding copied known bits for target instruction and filling in the values of known appropriately. To summarize, known bits analysis allows targets to optimize more 
by providing information on the values of registers. In GlobalSL, it's available to any machine function pass, not just combiners. And once it supports caching, it should be cheaper than selection leg ISL's equivalent. And our last component is simplified demanded bits. Simplified demanded bits is essentially a special case of combine. It basically tries to eliminate calculations that contribute to the bits that are never read using the demand mask. For example, here we don't actually need the shift operation as we don't demand anything beyond the 16 bit. This is not available in upstream yet, but we plan to fix that soon. We also plan to extend it by adding more optimizations. Now, Daniel will talk about testing, debugging, and the declarative combiner. Thank you, Vulcan. <laughs> Global ISO has quite a few benefits over Selection DAG with respect to testing. Selection DAG was something of a black box. It was difficult to test what was going on inside it. It was possible, possible to create an LLVMIR test that covered the path through it that you wanted. But this was really fragile. Another optimization could easily come along and prevent your test from testing what you intended. Global ISO, on the other hand, is composed of several smaller passes, each of which can be black box tested. This gives us better granularity, but it's still not ideal as there's quite a lot going on in some of these passes. However, we can improve on that too. Global ISL is readily unit testable in many places, and we use this to great effect in the legalizer and the combiner, where we configure an imaginary target with exactly the situation that we want, and we then have the algorithm perform one step. These unit tests can still use MIR input and use file, file check to check their output, so you don't lose any of the convenience that you have in LLVM lit. So our testing story is better, but sooner or later, something's gonna slip through the tests and escape. Especially since it's generally difficult to implement combines from scratch. There's generally a lot of special cases to account for, or floating point precision issues, and so on. Many of these special cases can lie dormant for years, as evidenced by the various uh, inst combine bugs that the Alive project has discovered. Another difficulty that we have is that it's especially hard to debug our GPU. Xcode has this great shader debugger that our customers can use for their projects, but we're not able to rely on it as compiler engineers because its correctness depends on our correctness. We've therefore had to come up with some debugging strategies, which we'll share with you on the next few slides. We found LLVM's block extractor pass to be very useful. Essentially, it extracts a basic block into a new function, and this can prevent certain optimizations from happening as whereas selection DAG had visibility on a basic block at a time, global ISO has visibility on one function at a time. Um, we can repeatedly extract different blocks into new functions and test whether the function now works correctly or not to identify a set of critical basic blocks that are involved in the bug. It's also possible to use this in a mode where the extracted function is compiled with a known good implementation like selection DAG um, and use that to test as well. Uh, use that to test whether your um, uh, code now works or not. But what if the basic blocks are still too big to really debug? Well, just break up the blocks into more and repeat the process. At the end of this, you'll know exactly which instructions are involved in the bug, and you can trace the uh, progression through the compiler and track down the root cause. This process has saved us countless hours of debugging and trying to spot the difference between good and broken code. All the components you need to do it are upstream, but you will need a small driver script to put it all together. Unfortunately, ours is closely tied in with our execution environment, so it's not generally uh, useful for other people. Um, however, the core command at the center of it all is shown on the slide here. And this particular example extracts two basic blocks from the function foo. And we can then feed that output into the compiler and run the result. So that brings you up to speed with what we did to reach the point where we could ship global ISL to our customers. 
we have some key principles that worked really well for us, and we'd like to share them with you. Uh, we think that they're generally good principles for other people who are trying to um, productize global ISEL and ship it. Start by minimizing the fallbacks on selection DAG. The ability to fall back on selection DAG when global ISEL can't handle something is great when you're bringing up a new code generator. As your tests pass on day one, and will continue to pass, so long as you don't introduce bugs, of course, um, as Global ISO takes over compilation, uh, responsibility for the compilation. However, falling back on selection DAG has a huge compile time cost, as it essentially throws away all the work you've done on that function so far, and starts again, but with a slower instruction selector. Uh, it also skews any quality metrics that you may be measuring, as you're you'll largely be measuring selection DAG early on. Once Global ISEL is compiling everything, or very nearly everything, start monitoring compile time and verostatic metrics, like the number of instructions you emit, or how, how many multiplies and loads you emit, and so on. We actually set up a TV in the corridor of our office for this, and um, people would um, tracking these metrics, and people would walk past them and um, if they noticed a regression, they'd pop their heads into our office and point them out to us. Um, this helped us to deal with problems quickly as and when they arose, but it also helped us to identify um, unexpected wins and celebrate them. Find a way to identify the optimizations that matter the most to your target. Unfortunately, this one's really hard and really boils down to staring at the code and trying to spot recurring patterns where you're not doing as well as you should. However, it is possible to get a rough idea of which combines are useful to import by using line-based code coverage to identify which selection DAG patterns, uh, which selection DAG combines uh, trigger fairly often. And there's a very good chance that similar combines in global ISO will have a big effect too. The block extractor can also be used here to um, reduce your test case down to one basic block and use that to identify which one to focus your efforts on. It's tempting to go after the bigger regressions, but we'd recommend that you actually go after the smaller ones where global is already pretty close to selection DAG's quality. The reason for this is that it's just simply easier to spot the problem and track it down and fix it. Um, also, after you've fixed a lot of these smaller problems, the bigger regressions will become a lot more manageable. This one may seem obvious, but start simple and build up from there. The simple end of the scale can have quite a large impact on the overall quality of your output. Also consider the overall applicability of your combines. There's some that are generally good for everyone, and some that are good for uh, targets with a common feature. And then there's some that are highly target specific. If your combine is more, uh, uh, more generally applicable, uh, consider contributing it to the generic combiner helper so that other people can benefit from your work. We started our combiners with a pre-legalize and a post-legalize pass because that made it easy to put our existing combines across. We generally expect that to be a good starting point for other people as well, but don't forget that this isn't a fixed pipeline. The constraints do get stricter the later in the pipeline you get, but you, you're free to do pretty much what, whatever you want whenever. Um, you can select instructions as early as the legalizer or the IR translator if you really want. We don't have very many new custom passes for our backend yet, but we have identified quite a few places where we could greatly simplify our code by moving an optimization out of where we traditionally had it in selection DAG and into its own dedicated pass. That wraps it up for what's been done. Now for a bit about what we're still working on. Something we've been working on is the declarative combiner. This is essentially a rework of the existing C++ based combiner that migrates the combines into a form that we can modify, analyze, and optimize, while still preserving the power of the C++. Aside from minimizing the match and replace boilerplate that needs to be uh, written, we want targets to be able to modify the rule sets for themselves. 
there's been many cases uh, for our backend where target independent combines have had no effect. And we could essentially just remove those combines and see no difference. Um, there's even worse, there's been some combines that have been actively harmful for us. Um, one particular example was that converting uh, the plus operation into wars uh, was remarkably harmful for one of our targets. And we had to put in a lot of effort to undo that optimization. And this was just wasting compile time that we could save by just not doing that first optimization. We do still want to share, though. We'd rather generally uh, collaborate and fix the occasional regression than lose out on the benefits of collaborative development. We also want targets to be able to analyze the rule sets. And um, we're, this will enable various tooling, which I'll get back to you later. And finally, we want to be able to take our possibly modified rule sets and optimize them as a whole, effectively replacing a linear sequence of combines with a decision tree that searches for the appropriate one. This is technically possible to do in C++, but it gets rather unmanageable uh, in a large rule set. To elaborate on the overall goals of the declarative combiner, we need to keep the ability to test rules in isolation. We need to improve the debuggability of the combiner, particularly with respect to infinite loops and large rule sets. I'm sure many of us have hit the uh, case in selection DAG where two conflicting combines have caused it to never terminate and found it difficult to track down which combines were involved. We think that the combiner should be able to detect excessive iteration and tell you which rules are involved to help you track down the cause. Similarly, it's difficult to track down one broken combine in a large rule set. And we think that the, the, the combiner should be able to help you by bisecting the uh, rule set to narrow it down to uh, one or a small number of rules. We also want to give targets more control over the combines that matter to them. They should be able to remove, modify, and prioritize the rules. And as I mentioned a moment ago, and we'll still get into later, um, it will enable various kinds of tooling. We also want to avoid baking algorithmic detail into the definition of these combines. There's a few reasons for this. Firstly, we think that there's room for improvement in the current combine algorithm. It's not aware of the cost and benefit of applying rules, especially where rules collaborate to produ produce an effect. Um, it, there is has one use, but that's something of a sledgehammer. And while it, it's capable of uh, preventing bad cases from happening, but it's also got a tendency to prevent good cases from happening. The other major reason is that uh, there's a lot of passes with this overall match and replace structure just with algorithmic details about when they match. We think it would be great if it was possible to have a common syntax that is able to be used in all of these passes. So here's an example of a declarative combiner rule. I don't want to go too much into the syntax uh, today uh, because we, we unfortunately don't have time for it. Uh, but I did want to mention that there's a section to describe the, the def section here describes the overall um, traits of the combined rule, the, the interface, if you will. The match section here describes the match that you want to perform. And the apply section here describes what you want to do after your um, rule is matched. But hang on a moment. We already have a syntax for patterns in selection DAG. Why aren't we using that? Well, the big problem with selection DAG patterns is they're not actually capable of describing all the shapes that a DAG can take. Um, it can really only describe trees, although it does have a feature to allow the same node to appear at multiple leaves of that tree. We want to be able to describe absolutely any DAG. We want to be able to describe matches that happen from the top down or from the middle outwards. Uh, we also want to be able to describe instructions that have multiple results, which selection DAG would force you into C++ for. Selection DAG also has uh, fairly limited room for extensibility. It's hard to fit something brand new into it. 
Here's an example of a combine that selection DAG uh, finds difficult. In the selection DAG style, each of these uh, extends is visited and they fold the load into them. Um, this duplicates the load and requires that uh, it rejects volatile in atomics unless has one use is true. Other optimizations will then have to try and minimize the number of loads that you caused with this uh, later, as loads are quite expensive to duplicate. Global ISO, on the other hand, can start at the G load and analyze all of its uses. For most targets, a sign extend is more expensive, so it's beneficial to eliminate that. Um, we therefore fold that sign extend into the load and into, to form a sign extending load. The any extend is an extend with undefined bits, which is compatible with this. So we just eliminate that and reconnect its use. The zero extend, however, does have a functional effect. So we insert a truncate and reconnect it, the zero extend uh, through that. This truncate and um, zero extend will eventually lower into an AND with a constant. This way around does support volatile and atomics and doesn't need additional work to deduplicate the loads later. It also doesn't require any analysis to, on whether it's safe to move the load because the load stays exactly where it is. Essentially, we reach a more optimal uh, state in one step. While I'm on the subject of um, the uh, combined rules themselves, one feature that's planned but not re yet ready for review is um, to make debug information a first-class feature of the syntax. Here we have an example of um, a, a rule that folds two instructions into one. And as you can see, it routes the debug info so that it merges the location information into that resulting instruction. A rule that emits more than one instruction will be able to route the uh, location information appropriately to best preserve that information. We've also been thinking about how to fit debug value into this, but we don't have a great idea that we're ready to share yet. So far, we've only talked about the rules themselves, but how are they composed into a combiner? Combiner helpers are declared in table gen so that their content can be different for each one. Their definition lists the uh, rules in priority order, which is similar in principle to the C++ statement order. Uh, where the order of your statements defines your priority. The generated combiner, however, is only on a bound to behave as if it's following this order. It's welcome to restructure how the match actually happens, so long as it honors this priority. The gen um, it, Listing every uh, combine like this uh, by name is rather inconvenient, which is why we also support groups to try and reduce it a bit. Groups allow subsets of uh, the priority list to be extracted out. You typically do this because you have a common optimization type or the combines collaborate to help with a common uh, target feature. Now, that code example doesn't actually look any better, does it? Um, it a lot of this, a, a lot of the group definitions would most likely live in headers. So let's just move those out of the way for the moment. That's much better. Here we have a combiner helper that does trivial combines and tries to postpone extends and tries to form extending loads wherever it can. The generated combiner can also emit a command line option to disable rules, and this forms the underpinning of the bisect feature. Um, disabling rules by name, as in this uh, third case here, um, is only available in asserts mode as we didn't want to bloat the uh, compiler binary by including a large string table. Now, sometimes groups are really close to what you want to include, but there's a flaw for your target. We want combiners, uh, combiner groups to be able to modify their, um, uh, their contents uh, when you include them. Uh, for example, you might take a whole group but disable one rule that's causing problems for your target. Or you might add an additional uh, predicate to a, a rule to test whether it's profitable for your target. So how will you get all of this? 
Well, you just add a few lines to your combiner info to initialize and call the combiner helper and invoke table gen to generate the code behind it. Before I move away from the definition, I just want to mention that there's a lot of room for extensibility in this syntax, and this should allow us to accommodate all kinds of things that we haven't even considered yet. Once we have the definition, a whole load of tooling possibilities open up. We can get uh, co rule-based coverage information to find out if a rule is used or tested. Uh, we can have a profiler to judge whether it's actually worth including. It, is it spending a lot of time matching but only triggering in one special case? Uh, we can potentially have some kind of exploratory mechanism to um, manually apply rules and see if that outperforms what the combiner algorithm is doing by itself or not, and use that to guide improvements to the combiner. Debugging should become much improved with bisection and loop detection. It also becomes uh, feasible to uh, plug rules into a proving engine, such as Alive. We might also be able to have a debugger, a state machine debugger, that allows you to find out why a particular combine didn't fire. The last one on this list, uh, MIR patches, isn't strictly speaking a feature of the combiner as such, but the combiner would be an important beneficiary of it. The overall idea here is to use MIR dumps and a patch-like format to be able to reproduce the state at any given point during a pass and use this to uh, find out why certain things didn't happen or track down bugs or possible improvements. And of course, we're continuing to work on all the things that we discussed in uh, Vulcan section of the talk. Uh, just to recap, back in 2017, we got Global ISL working for our target, but we hadn't really worked on code quality at that point, so it wasn't as good. Over the last year and a half, two years, uh, we've added several facilities uh, to uh, Global ISL. And by 2019, the instruction selection passes are 45% faster than their selection DAG equivalents while producing code quality that's on par with selection DAG. Other targets are also actively working on global ISL. Um, in particular, our colleagues in uh, AR64 are seeing good results too. They tell me that they're getting compile times that are as fast as fast ISL while producing smaller code than uh, fast ISL. And of course, we enabled this in iOS 13 and we shipped it to our customers. Uh, with a bit of luck, you're even using it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That sums up our talk on how we generate optimized code for global iCell and shipped it to our customers, as well as a bit about what we're working on at the moment. Uh, Vulcan and I would like to thank you for coming to our talk and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, we have a microphone down here in the front if you'd like to ask any. So uh, on your target, um, is now global ISIL enough to generate code for everything or are there still cases where you need to fall back on, on the selection tag? So there are a few cases where it's not enabled for certain shader kinds, but generally it's enabled and um, we've disabled fallbacks where it is enabled. Okay. Uh, so where, where it's enabled, it's completely enabled and it's the only thing happening. Okay. Uh, well, working in the legalizer, I've run into a lot of cases where the observer fails to be updated and then this silently broke in some way. Do you have any way of detecting this kind of issue in the combiner? Um, so Aditya recently added um, facility for checking whether you've been updating the CSE information. Um, for other things that might be uh, paying attention to the observer, uh, there's currently no checking for that. But it's something we should do. Right? Yes, we absolutely should. <laughs> What's your recommendation for a new target? Would you bypass ISL and just go with global ISL? Um, so that's a difficult one. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I think it depends on so, your case, probably. Like, depends on what? Your case, probably. So, like, yeah, yeah it, it would vary from case yeah. to case, but I, I would generally recommend at least giving it a try. Yeah. Um, it is a lot easier to maintain and uh, work on. 
And bring um, up. Selection DAG, you kind of have to have everything before any of it starts working. Mm -hmm. Whereas Global ISO, you can test each individual, individual piece and gradually build up and then test the whole thing together. Um, it is possible to ha test each individual piece and the whole thing not to work uh, as a whole. Um, but you're in a much better state because you're testing each piece. But of course, you have to have an, uh, an instruction selector before the, uh, yes. the target works at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, I think you have to commit to one or the other when you're when you're first porting. Um, for the first, just yeah. to get it working. Yeah. I mean, you, if you're bringing up a brand new target, you would have to commit one way or the other. Um, a lot of the targets that I'm um, doing it at the moment are porting from an existing selection DAG implementation. So if, you're bringing, if you were bringing up a brand new target, what would you do? Um, I would start with Global ISO because my experience has been pretty good there. Okay, that's the, that's the answer I was looking yeah. at. <laughs> <laughs> has anything been done with uh, Global ISO to handle the constrained floating point intrinsics and conveying the uh, constraints across the Global ISO barrier? Um, what do you mean by the constraints? So um, the, the, these are experimental intrinsics right now that uh, let you uh, change at runtime the rounding mode and the uh, exception behavior for floating point. Um, so there are like additional semantics that need to be observed. You can't assume default rounding mode, these kinds of things. I don't remember if we did anything um, special. I'm not aware of yeah. anything. They, this doesn't come up in our particular mm -hmm. uh, GPU target. Okay. Um, I don't know if any of the CPU targets have looked yeah. into it yet. Okay, well, I'd be interested in talking to you about it later. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Hi, how do you identify the patterns that you're going after? Um, you mean the combiner patterns? Yeah. Uh, so code coverage is one of them. Like, so if you enable code coverage and compile a bunch of like, programs. Oh, that's how you, yeah, that, how do that, you decide which ones to write? How so, do you find the slow code that needs to be combined? Um, that's fairly difficult. And yeah. really, it's just staring at the code and going, oh, this, ha this is happening a lot. I, I need to write a combined rule to try and merge these together. Yeah, okay. so there are two sections. Like, first, you need to, like, you can take a look at the, like, static metrics, like instruction count, registers used. Mm -hmm. And you need to also, like, take a look at the, like, runtime performance. So okay. It's both. You, you reported a huge performance speed up. Where does this come from? So, um, the performance speed up that you reported on that. That's compile time performance speed up. That's the compile yeah, time. Yeah, you, you mean the 45%. Mm -hmm. How about the runtime? Um, so, uh, runtime we're For getting For runtime, we were yeah, getting similar performance like selection, I guess. Yeah. So. And then, because doing global SA, so do you increase liveness of a lot of variable and then register allocator has to deal with more? Yes. So do you have any mitigation for it? Uh, there is a pass called localize it. Like, especially for like constants, for example, we emit all of them in the entry basic block. For example, for some cases, localizer can be used to like move the constant uh, next to the values, basically. So yeah, there are these kind of issues, yeah. Okay. And uh, that's all the time we've got for questions. But um, Vulcan and I and other people who are working on Global ISO will be around the conference. So feel free to grab us and ask us questions. And we'll have a round table. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what time it is because there's been a bit of confusion about that. Um, but hopefully you can find it on the schedule by the time we're done with the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.